All right. Sign this down. Yeah. So I'm, I'm streaming right now. Yeah. Everybody out there is probably going, what the heck is going on? But we are... Uh, is everything on? You're on? At, I'm on. We're at the local doing um, 2023 code changes. But I... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Thanks. That's what I like about like the these good. groups, yeah. yeah. We're here for knowledge, free breakfast. Like it. Pick up all the changes. Go changes. Networking, uh, very important. Well, we got two people that are basically looking for. 17s out there, code books, we have some 20s, and we have a couple 2023s. Great. You guys know the code. It's a change. We're looking to expand that knowledge and what. You're working on your skill set. That's what Team Tech is all about. Making making great friends. Number one goal. Second goal is to get the Elevated skills, high level skills, and the same way. So that I'm not going to go away. Right now, that's here in the third October, right? Renewable energy, high management.
Local 134 represent. There we go. A lot of hands. Get some contractors. Mayors? Yeah, they don't want to raise their hand. Inspectors? Inspectors, right? It's Tom Lichtenstein. He may be way late. He's sorry, he's the white guy, no right? It's the duty. I didn't tell you about my eyesight, did I? Yeah. No. everybody <laughs> only 600 slots
The question was, will you two offer So we'll continue to offer that. We have the main talk about education. So this is interesting on the
Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you. Cool beans. Thanks. Good morning. Guys and gals ready to get on some with some code? My name is Tom Dimitrovich. I'm with Eden, and I am on code panels two and ten for the National Electrical Code. I was uh, my first code cycle, I believe, was the, was the 17 cycle. Um, anything you hear us say is not on behalf of the code panel, NFPA, or anybody. What comes out of here usually starts up here, and it's all from the heart. So we are hopefully going to have a good, engaging uh, discussion. But so uh, I've been in the industry for. Man, I graduated in 90 from college, so I got my bachelor's of science in electrical engineering, professional engineering license in the state of Pennsylvania, and um, been involved with the code 70B for maintenance. So if you guys and gals have questions on maintenance or anything of that regard, today's your day and you have my contact information. Mr. McClochie. Hi, thanks, Tom. My name's Tim McClochie. One thing I didn't see is inspectors. Are there any inspectors? Hi, hi. Yeah, there's a few. Wow. All right. Awesome. Um, I've, I've been, I'm the chief billing official, supervisor of inspections, electrical inspector for uh, the town of West Hartford in a little state called Connecticut. I started in the trade in uh, 1987 when I graduated high school. I'm on code making panel three. I started on the 2017 cycle. So I've been uh, on a couple cycles. Uh, I'm like, Tom, I, I went to college, nine of them. Um, after 13 years, I did get my associate's degree. So uh, I'm more of a field person, and, and that's why I love working with Tom, because we have kind of the field, and then we have the field in the engineering. And uh, I think it's uh, exciting. The thing I like to do is, is we talk about the changes. You have the book. We, we try to add information that's not in the book that's interesting. So like Tom said, when we talk, it's, it's something like that. Yeah. Um, but we'll give you the information, hopefully, behind why the changes. That's one of the reasons why I got into the code, is I like to see, like, okay, here's the change. Why did that happen? So we try to, uh, when we're together, and I try to uh, explain what the rules are and where they started. And we have some 17 here, we have some 2020, we're talking about the 2023, and we are also just last week worked on the first draft for the 2026. So sometimes it gets a little confusing about what yeah. book we're in depending on where we are, but um, we usually figure it out, one of us, so. Yeah, and just in case you're wondering, I'm from Weirton, West by God, Virginia, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So how many Steeler fans in the, in the house? <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> all right, all right. All right, you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so you all have, I think everybody has a, uh, a code change book, right, from the IEI. So a lot of the material that we talk about outside of commentary, you'll find in the book. Um, most of the slides, pretty much a lot of the slides, if not all the slides, are, uh, are in the book as well. So and this, there's a lot of text in there giving you the background. So please... Uh, you can refer to that as we go through. We're just going to basically start from the beginning and, and work our way through. Um, copyright. So there's your, we're going to be talking 2023 code changes, but if when you think about any of these, these sections that we talk about, there's a journey that the code goes through every three years. So what we'll try to do is give you some perspective on where we've come from and how, and how we're getting to where we're going and then whether or not we've gotten there, I don't know. And I say the code book is like a fine wine. It gets better with time. But we all know sometimes it turns to vinegar, so you gotta be careful. <laughs> you know, and that's a great point. And while we're on the 2023, if you're on the 2017 or the 2020, you'll know the grayed out areas in here that are revisions in the 2023, which we'll talk about some. If you're in the 17 and you happen to skip the 2020 edition and go to the 2023, that change obviously is not going to be indicated in the 2023 because it was indicated in the 2020. So sometimes it can be confusing if you skip an edition of the code book, you're looking for a change. It's not going to be indicated in this book because it was indicated in that book. So, yep. All right. So let's talk about the cycle, the stages. If you're not familiar or if you are familiar, we're, we are right now in the process of developing the 2026 code cycle. So we are in step one, actually, yeah, step one, we're still in the public input. So we have, we've, for the 2026 code cycle, we've had the first draft meetings in January. So what typically happens if people say, well, the code panel members write the code, that is totally not true. You all write the code. 
The code panel only acts on public inputs and public comments. Now, not only, I mean, sometimes we right. get creative, and that's typically when things go wrong. But in any case, um, the, the public inputs that you all see and you all are all using the code in the field, when you have issues, if it's not clear, clarity is very important for the accuracy of the installation, whether you're inspecting or installing or designing, you gotta make sure that we're all on the same page. And if you, if you end up in a discussion or a debate with, with each other over language in this book, that's probably an opportunity for a public input or a comment. So you have the public input phase, the public comment stage, that's, we'll publish a first draft. I think the first draft gets published in August. Yeah, end of July, August. Yeah, July, August timeframe for the, for the 2026 code cycle. And then you'll have chances to uh, put public comments in on what was done in the first draft. And then we'll have in October, uh, the second draft meeting where all the code panels, have 18 code panels, They'll all sit around the table, argue, debate. There's a little bit of mud wrestling in there and, and throwing <laughs> stuff, but it, it gets, uh, we, we make sausage, basically, right? <laughs> and then your next chance is the annual meeting. So if you didn't get what you wanted in the first draft and you didn't get what you wanted in the second draft, you go to the annual meeting. As long as you are a member of six months or longer, you can vote from the floor if there are certified amending motions made to change what has been done in the process so far. And then finally, if you still didn't get what you want, you can appeal to the council. But the further you go along in the process, the less technical the complaints get and issues and more um, legal because it's about a process and whether or not you followed the process to get to where you're at. That's sort of the overall process, and then finally we'll, we'll publish. So every code cycle, every three years, we go through the same thing. Yeah. A little over 4,000 public inputs, right? Yeah, so it's interesting. So the, here's some information about the, the panels, and, and you'll see there's 36 members. IEI has 36 members on the panels, typically two on a panel. Uh, on panel three, I have a alternate, and uh, we go through what, what is submitted. Whatever I come up with as an IAI member, I have to go through the, the chapter or the, the uh, headquarters of IAI. We put our public inputs to them. And we're, we're required to put at least three or four in, which usually isn't an issue. So we write public inputs, we send them into IAI, and they send them up. Now, the 2023 was a little different because, of course, the time that we were in was COVID. And I'll tell you what, it's, you know, Tom will agree, it's kind of hard to make, it's hard to make good code, and it takes a cycle or two for something to get straight especially when you're doing it virtual. The task groups typically meet virtual because it's really hard to get that many people together. But when we did it for the 2023, uh, 20, a couple years ago, because like Tom said, we're already working on the 2026. When we did it for the 2023, it was virtual and it was tough to have four or five monitors going with a group of 30 people and trying to answer questions and keep everything straight. But we did get through it, it went pretty well. Um, you'll see here that we had 406 public inputs. Now, panel three, where I'm on, we have article 300, uh, Article 590, we have 700s, which, which is, we're going to get into a couple really big changes of technology, especially in the 2023, 2020 and 2023. And we had about 300 public inputs to, to talk about and discuss and, and see how we're going to move forward. So out of, out of the 4,006 4, public inputs for the whole book, 8, 1,800, a little over 1,800 first revisions were made. Those were first revisions that were um, proposed to be changed, made it through the first draft, and then opened to the public comment. 1,956 public comments were made on those first revisions through that process that Tom showed you. And then you'll see the second revisions added uh, 900 more. So those were the changes that were made in the first two steps. But like Tom said, it doesn't, your opportunity to make a difference or make a change doesn't end there. It went on to 441 correlating notes, and then now it's certified amending motions. I, I, so, so, so what happens with you, you know, understand? Yeah, no, go ahead. What's, I, I, okay, so, so what happens is, let's say you didn't like what, you, what, what, what we did or what was done. You can file what we call as a notice of intent to make a motion. See, that's and why then I get confused. It, yeah, NITMAM. They, they call it a NITMAM, right? <laughs> so then what happens is you have to qualify to make a NITMAM. In some cases, you may not be able to, to uh, argue against something because you weren't a part of the process. So you, you go. gotta follow the rules there. And then, then your NITMAM becomes certified, and that's when NFPA follows the rules of the process, and they say, okay, 
A, is this a verified, is this person's um, permitted to do this? And then they'll certify it. And then from the annual meeting, it's a huge room. Hundreds of people are standing in there and everybody uses their phone these days. Before it used to be a little clicker. So, and back in the day, we used to raise our hand yeah. and then they would do division of the house and have everybody walk around and try to figure out, do the counts. But you just have an app on your phone, you basically vote on these NIPMAMs. And if you, if you vote to remove something, Let's say they made a change and you didn't like it, and you vote to go back to a, the previous edition. That will stand at the floor. But if you want to say something didn't pass and I want to put it in the code, and it passes from the floor, then it goes back to the code making panels and they have to reaffirm it and vote on it and they can still say, <laughs> you're full of crap, right? So uh, that's sort of what that process, and there were 55 of those at the annual meeting for the 2023 SCOAD cycle. Thanks, Tom. There's your four, there's your four parts. And, and we're gonna get into acronyms and NIPMAM is one of the acronyms I never say right. So I go to yep. Tom. <laughs> so there are 18 code making panels. IAEI has two members to Tim's point earlier on each code making panel. You have a principal and an alternate. Both of those individuals can verbalize and talk and discuss and share their knowledge. And typically every code panel focuses on certain things like uh, panel two, I'm on panel two, we focus on article 210, brand circuits. That's all of your AFCIs, GSCIs, receptacle locations, all that good stuff. Article 220 is panel two, that's your load calculations. Panel three. Yeah, with panel three, like I said, we have wiring methods, uh, article 300. So we get into the general wiring methods we have Article 590, temporary uh, temporary installations. And then when we get into the 700s, you're, some of you are in the 17, so things were a little different there, but we have Article 725, 722 now, and 726 are our newer articles. We have those articles too, and we have some material in the back of the book. Yep. So if you wanted to know which code making panel covered which articles, in the front of the book, you'll see the people's names, and you'll see the, the, the uh, articles that are addressed by each code panel. And typically, the, hopefully, the individuals on each of those code panels have an expertise in the area of what they're covering. And a lot of the names that you'll see, you might see people around here. Uh, how many people in the room are on a code making panel? There you One, go. two, three, Tom. Aren't you on panel seven? Yeah, we got panel seven marinas. What panel? What code panel? 16 and an FPA 72, eight, seven, seven, 18, 18. 18. You want a panel, code panel? Are anybody over here? Yeah. 855, okay, yeah. So we have other NFPA documents too. So uh, uh, the, the nice thing about these events, and that's, somebody mentioned it earlier, yeah. networking. You know, Absolutely. get people, find out where, what they're involved with. There's a lot of expertise in the audience. So Absolutely. if you ever wanted to know what's, what's covered in each, it's right there in the book. So there's 18, and then you have the correlating committee. So the way it works, each of the code panels will focus on the changes and, and the area of, uh, of their expertise on the articles that they're focused on. Then the correlating committee's job is to make sure that one panel doesn't step on another panel's toes, right? So a good example of that, GFCI protection. GFCIs went, you had 210.8B right, for other than dwelling units. So that didn't exist until the 1990-some code. Yeah. I can't remember which one it was. There was a, a, an addition of the code where they created 210.8b, and before, if it wasn't a dwelling unit, where did we go? Back of the book, chapter six, chapter five for healthcare, 555 for marinas, uh, we had RV parks. Well, then we created 210.8b, and then we, we kept it at 15 and 20 amp receptacle outlets, and then we expanded it beyond that and we created a conflict with the chapters in the back of the book. The correlating committee recognizes those, hopefully sooner rather than later, right. and then they make sure that we have meetings to iron out the differences so that we want clarity. You don't want to have a requirement in the chapter two that conflicts with something in the other chapters and when it's a safety, especially GFCIs, right? So shock protection, Back in, uh, in RV parks, we said 15 and 20 amp receptacles. Back in 210.8b, we said outdoor receptacle outlets, all outdoor receptacle outlets up to 60 amp or 50 amp, single phase up to 100 amp, three phase had to be GFCI protected. Well, now we got a conflict. Which one do we go with? So that's what the correlating committee does. They try to solve problems like that. Yeah, that's a good point. 
These are your codes and standards committee for IEI who helped put together the, uh, the materials that we're looking at. These are all of us subject matter experts. This is where the rubber meets the road on yeah. why the materials that you have, the book, the slides, and the content is uh, very critical and, and uh, you know, has a lot of depth. So, and we get that because of experts in the industry who contribute. We're not gonna go through terms. These are all of the sponsors. All right, let's talk code-wide changes. Thank code God we got changes. through all that. Jeez, oh man, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> so first, before we start, this the style manual. How many people have seen the style manual? Can you see style manual? Not too many. Not too many, it's okay, an important so, document. Yeah, it's a really important document. And actually, I gotta be honest, I didn't know about it until I became an inspector in the field. I didn't really look at this, you know, manual. But this, this style manual is, I don't know, would you call it the recipe book? What would you call it? The, the, the it tells you how the book's laid out. tells you how the book's laid out. And it tells you this is where you get shall be, shall not be, shall be permitted. The language of how the code, the, the language in the code is written comes out of the style manual for consistency. It doesn't use vague terms. We're going to talk about a lot of changes that were caused by the new updated style manual. So this is a, a great, we can get it to you. Um, you can get it, it's free. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing to have and just go through it and it helps you understand how the code book's laid out and written. And one of the changes, so they, when they change the style manual, that tells you that, like, for example, one of the, the changes that we're going to talk about is moving the definitions. All defined terms now have to be in Article 100. So that is in, in, in uh, cooperation or in accordance with the style manual. Dot two, for the 2023 code cycle, the dot twos in all of the sections pretty much are driven to be reconditioned equipment, yeah. not necessarily driven by the, the style manual for that cycle, but they added some requirements for the 2026 cycle that says all your dot twos are gonna be listing requirements, all of your dot threes are going to be reconditioning requirements. So yeah. they drive the organization of the book through the style manual. So we had some uh, changes in, in uh, uh, how we do informational notes for clarity. They, they try to address usability of the code. So they have a, a correlated committee has a usability task group. The usability task group basically will make suggested changes to the style manual and they wanna make sure that the code books are easy to understand and interpret. We changed the definitions for searchability. Um, all of your different code panel references, any acronyms that we're trying to use, we try to, to drive consistency. All your terms are in Article 100 now. Yeah, now this is interesting because again, the first change in the, in the 2020 moved the hazardous location definitions to a part three. So the first step of moving the definitions in the 2020, started in the 2020. We had general over a thousand volts and then part three was hazardous locations. So in the 2020, you'll notice that. In the 2023, that's when the rest of the definitions came over. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that when it comes yep. up. And when they moved the definitions, now, when they moved the definitions, they had to do a couple things. Because remember, in the past, in the, in the earlier code books, you would have a dot two in, say, 555 for marinas, or in RV parks, or uh, 625 for electric, electric vehicles, vehicles, right? So all of the definitions that were in that dot two pertained only to that article. So when they moved the defined terms to Article 100, they had to maintain that, um, the fact that you might have a definition that only applies to that article. You can't use it in other areas of the NEC. So to maintain the integrity of, of how we approach and understand the def defined terms, they laid the, the document out. You'll see the parens that have 555. In that case, it says 555. When you see a paren, on, on a defined term, that definition only applies to Article 555, okay? Don't use it for anything else. And I say that's important because there are a, there are a few terms where they created the definition, they moved the definitions, and they find out they have the same term defined more than one time. So, but there are different definitions. So you've got to understand the perspective of the defined term with regard to where it's being used. Why are terms important? Right. Yeah, that's a, and that's a, it's a great point. Why are terms important? You know, it all starts with me, and that was one of my big uh, top 10 changes for 2023 when we did a little video is, uh, how can you go find something if you can't define it? 
So, you know, most of the questions that I get, and I don't, I don't know about Tom, but most of the questions I get are either star or I can find the answer in the definition or the scope of the article, which we'll talk about. But if, if we're looking at conductors, we need to know what, what conductors, where are they going to? Are they service conductors, Article 230? Are they, are they branch circuit conductors, 215? Are they outdoor branch circuits, 225? So it's really important, feeders 215, it's really important that we, we know we have that definition so that we can start there, so that we can find the rules for what we're looking for. Yes. And, and the, the corrosive environment is one that sticks in my mind. I think that's a 680, uh, 680 definition that moved and it causes a little bit of issue because now somebody will see that definition in the front and say, oh, we have a definition now for corrosive environment. Well, you do, but it, it sticks to article 680 only, it's just for that article. So there's a little confusion there that, that if knowing this is very helpful. And, and, you, and you've, you can create the need for a definition of a term the moment you have a requirement, right? right. So 210.8, we, we added uh, crawl spaces. Yeah. Next thing you know, no one knows what a crawl space is. Yeah. All right, we need a definition, what's a crawl space? Because that's not a crawl space. Well, you gotta get on your knees. No, I don't care, that's not a crawl space, right? And we had the debates at panel two on how to define a crawl space. And what blew my mind was, I had a guy from an industrial sitting across from me, Charlie, and Charlie says, uh, we were talking about defining a crawl space by the height of the room, ceiling. Thinking, okay, well, if it's a four foot, is it six foot? And I'm, you know, we're having that debate. And then Charlie raises his hand, and he goes, I have crawl spaces in rooms with 20 foot ceilings. Well, how the heck does that happen, right? And, and he explained, well, they have all the duct work, they have all the pipes, the ceiling is 20 feet, but you still gotta crawl in there because of all the equipment. So we had a hard time defining what a crawl space is. If you don't have a definition in the code, you fall back to Merriam-Webster, okay? Merriam-Webster edition will tell you if it's a general term, you would go to Webster. And what's another location? If you, if you have a requirement for, let's say, a uh, kitchen, or oh, you have a definition of a kitchen. Let's say it's a room in a building. What, the latest one was um, what, habitable gra uh, basements. Yeah. Right, so in some cases they were like, well, is it a basement if I have the one half of the house is under uh, in dirt and then the other half of the house I have a walk out. So is it a basement, is it not a basement, right? So we went back to the building codes definitions of what a basements are because that is something that's consistent. So if the building code says, on, on, and on the drawings it says this is a basement, well, guess what? It looks like a basement, it smells like a basement, it's a freaking basement. So you'll sometimes go back to the building codes in opposed to Merriam-Webster, okay? So, but the definitions help us understand when we get into a requirement. The other important one. Yeah. When you see anything in the code that has brackets, I don't know what, they, what the proper term is, the square brackets, right? So you have the parens, I think they call them, or is that parens? I don't know. You've got the, 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 the ones that are like half round, that tells you what article. You got the square ones, that indicates what they call extracted text. So that means that this definition is exactly the way it looks in that other document, okay? And it's from NFPA 303, section 3.3.5. Now, why might that be important? Let's say that you're trying to understand for your application the definition of a term that's extracted from NFPA 303, and you never heard of it. Do you think that maybe you need to understand NFPA 303 if you're looking at a term and the installation requirements that are extracted from another document? Absolutely, right? So these are, I call them uh, breadcrumbs, right? They're little breadcrumbs that, that take you on your journey to help you understand the application. So NFPA, NFPA 303, you'll go to Article 555, uh, 517 for healthcare. Right. Yep. You'll see 99 colon sections. That's all extracted text from NFPA 99. So if you're doing a healthcare and you're following the National Electrical Code for Healthcare and you see 99 colons a lot, do you think you need to get NFPA 99? Probably and understand it, right? What else in there? Oh, and what? Well, the defined term. Now, the, the, I, you know, I love this slide. When, when Tom said he made this slide, I said, I love this slide. There's a lot of information on this slide about definitions. And, and another one of the bigger changes is the term defined uh, up top. You know how you see overcurrent protection, branch circuit? When you're trying to find something, why doesn't it just say branch circuit, overcurrent protection? Well, for the 2023, and, and basically electronic versions for searchability, to aid in searchability and to aid in people, what you'll see is you'll see 
overcurrent protection branch circuit, but then you'll see that term branch circuit over, uh, over branch circuit overcurrent protection. And this way, when you search the phrase, you'll find it the way it is. It might not pick it up the other way backwards. So for searchability, that's really helpful, really useful. I, I, I like that change a lot. Watch the tripod. The uh, code panel, when it says CMP7, that tells you who owns the def definition. A big misconception is that code panel one owns all the definitions in Article 100. Yeah. They don't. Uh, oh, oh. For overcurrent protection, like what is a circuit breaker, what's a fuse, that's code panel 10 because their expertise is overcurrent protection. Branch circuits, panel two because that's their expertise. So all of the defined terms may, may lie with a different code panel. I don't know of any reason why if you're practically applying the code book that you need to know yeah. which code panel other than if you want to ask a question uh, or uh, you know somebody on the code panel wants to say, that's mine. So in any case, um, the, you have the defined term, and I will say NFPA link. How many of you have NFPA link? Got a couple. That's great. Another best kept secret. Uh, NFPA link is an online, they're, they're not doing PDFs anymore. So PDFs, Adobe Acrobat, the copies of the code are out. Uh, NFPA has gone to this online experience called NFPA link. And what I like about NFPA link once you have the membership, once you get your subscription, which is relatively, it's like oh, like 10 bucks a month or something like that, um, you have access to not just the National Electrical Code, you have access to any of those NFPA documents. And you can search across all of those. So yeah. if you're looking for the requirements for a specific application or a defined term, you can search all of the NFPA documents right from that. It's a really great resource. It is. And, and and also gives you the back copies. You can get to the back editions for Yeah, you can get research. earlier editions as well. Really, uh, really great re resource for you. We already talked about .2. We, so what we did in the 2023 was we reserved .2 for reconditioned equipment. Here's another one. Understanding the defined term for reconditioned. Really important. Because whether or not you are into the requirements for reconditioned will determine what you are doing to the device right. or the equipment, right? So if you understand the defined term, and if you meet the definition of being of reconditioning a product, then you know you're into the requirements. If you don't meet the, def meet the definition, then you're not reconditioning it. So um, they put all of those requirements in dot two, pretty much in dot two. If you look through the code, I identified a you know dot 16, 404, they left it in dot 16, 495, 517. So, but for the most part, all of your dot twos in the 2023 code focused yeah, on reconditioning. You know, and, that's, and that's a great point, Tom. And it, and it goes back to the parallel numbering system. When did that start? Like 20, 2011, I think, maybe some, like that, somewhere yeah. on there. The parallel numbering system made things easier to find, increased the code's usability. And the dot twos used to be definitions. Now they're going to be reconditioned equipment, right? Dot 10 use is permitted. Dot 12 use is not permitted. The dot 30s you'll see in securing and supporting. Um, dot 100 is, is grounding and bonding. So the parallel numbering system really helps out. Now it's a good thing because sometimes you can get the right answer from the wrong section because sometimes securing and supporting is the same, but it's a bad thing because sometimes you get the wrong answer from the wrong section. So it's really important to make yeah. sure that you're in the right section, but that's very helpful. So medium voltage, how many people in here work on medium voltage above a thousand volts, AC, 1500 volts DC? We've got a few. Some. Well, medium voltage got some love in the 2023 code cycle. And I'll tell you, there weren't technical changes. The goal of the task group, which was chaired by Robert Osborne from UL, Robert, uh, Robert's team basically wanted to take a look at medium voltage and they reorganized. They did not make technical changes, but I'll tell you what it, what it did. They created some new articles. So they took uh, the, the contents of 210 that applied to medium voltage, we put it in 235. So panel two moved it to 235. Panel 10, which covers articles 215, 225, 230, 240, 242 for surge, uh, we took and we made for feeders, we made a part in 235 for feeders. You have branch circuits in, in 235, you have feeders in 235, and you have services in 235. So we moved all of that content over to these different articles 
And what we started to recognize, we did the move in the second draft. Now here's another a little trick, or not a trick, but another little uh, rule in the process. You can't introduce new material in the second draft, okay? So we, we made changes in the first draft that were not technical. We moved some things around. And then the second draft, we did some major moving. But when we did the moving, we started to recognize there are some issues with the medium voltage requirements. Unfortunately, a lot of people do not follow the NEC with medium voltage because they assume that it's the NESC that's covering it. And the NESC is used by utilities. If it's utility owned, it's not covered by the code. If it's customer owned, owned by the facility, it's covered by the National Electrical Code. You need to follow the NEC requirements. So, we're raising the awareness, A, that you gotta be looking at these requirements, and if you are in the room and you do medium voltage, I would encourage you to read through those requirements. Take a look at what the NEC has in regard to the medium voltage requirements, because we need good technical public inputs around medium voltage to help guide that language. Yeah, that's a great point, Tom. And, and, and Tom made the point, but just to reiterate the point is it's basically took information that was in the book, put it into areas that were easier to find with the hope that it's gonna be more likely to get used. And, and that's kind of yep. the start. And it's, it's, I'd say that's definitely a long-term project. I mean, it's gonna take definitely a code yep. cycle, couple code cycles. And to if get you that. think about it, over the years, we moved from 600 volts yeah. being the cutoff point to 1,000. Why'd we do that? That was because of the alternative energy, the PV guys. They were basically saying, look, we're gonna take an inverter, and we gotta make it lighter, more efficient, and lower cost. Because we wanna, we wanna basically for photovoltaics, you know it's what it's all about. PV is gonna last when the dollars per, your return on investment survives, or, you know, is realistic. So they took the transformer out of the inverters. When they take the transformer out of the inverters, you lightened it up, you took the iron out, you took the loss out, but now to get the voltages that you need, you had to pump it up. So they went up to 1,000 volts and said, hey, I need 1,000 volts on for medium voltage because if I'm at 1,000 volts on my inverters because I took the transformers out, now I'm in the medium voltage requirements, which then adds a ton more issues to those applications. So we re increased the AC up to 1,000. The DC is 1,500. The reason that is there is to align with international and IEEE standards. So internationally, 1500 is, no, is recognized as your medium big line of demarcation for medium voltage when it comes to DC applications. And, and in all of your IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, all of their uh, technical references, all I recognize 1500 volts DC as that line of demarcation. And that's important because that's how we make electrical distribution equipment, right? The standards around uh, the uh, listing requirements yeah. have recognized it as well. So we want to make sure that the code and the standards are in alignment with each other. That's what yeah. guys like Tom Lichtenstein and others at UL do. They watch these changes and then they go back and go, all right, we might have to change the standard to accommodate and align with the code requirements. Yeah, great point. And the last point, just to, you know, again, just to reiterate, you'll see that these new articles say over 1,000 volts at 1,500 volts DC. The, the articles that they came from will say up to 1,000 volts, 1,500 volts DC. Yes. So this way you're, you kind of know where you're at. And one of the things we did, we, we put in some of these, we put an informational note right. to tell everybody, hey, don't forget, over there in 235, there's medium voltage requirements. So, right. <laughs> Photo moment. All right. Copper clad, that got a little uh, bit of attention. It, it sure did. Yes, yeah, very controversial, this one. So we've been using copper clad for ages, yeah. years, yeah, right? Absolutely. The change that was, they wanted to have in copper clad was to introduce a 10 amp number 14, 14 American wire gauge conductor. That was the controversial topic. So there were a bunch of public inputs in the 2023 code cycle. Panel two. We, ex we accepted the 10 amp circuit for AFCI in 210.12, 210.8, we recognized it. Uh, we also put it in the um, small, uh, we, well, the 2026, we put it in the small conductor, I think. Yeah, we did. And then we recognized that we want to limit the use of a 10 amp circuit because we don't have a 10 amp receptacle, right? I got a 15 amp receptacle, I got 20 amp, and, we, and you all know the rules on what you can put on a 15, what you can put on a 20, 30, et cetera. 
So we don't have a 10 amp receptacle. So we said, look, we can't permit you to put it on receptacles. We can permit it to be used on lighting. Think about what we're doing in lighting. We're going to LED lighting, much lower current draw. You can go with smaller conductors, go a longer way, right? So the uh, copper clad aluminum was, uh, they made a bunch of public inputs throughout the code. We'll show you a few of those, the changes. Yeah. But chapter, chapter three, in Article 310, which is code making panel six, did not accept a number 14 copper clad at 10 amps. Yeah, and I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, but copper clad aluminum is different than straight up aluminum. And uh, there was a great book, uh, Hot Connections, I think it is, about the aluminum fire. I think it was the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's really interesting. Uh, so, so copper clad aluminum, it's been around a long time. It's, it's out, like Tom said, it's getting more attention, but people confuse it with straight aluminum. And it's not straight aluminum. Has it, it will talk about the requirements of how yep. much is on the outside. But there's copper. Oh, there you go, 10%. So, so what it is is there's 10% cross section of the conductor that's actually copper on the outside. So the benefits are it gives you the benefits of copper connections and the ampacity of aluminum. But when you're using this, you're upsizing your conductors. So they say less voltage drop, less heating. And with the new technologies coming that are requiring more and more copper, copper clad aluminum is getting more attention because it doesn't use as much copper and can be used for the same things. So here's some information about it. The, the marriage between the copper and aluminum is a metallurgical. I went to the facility to see how they, they made that. And basically they put aluminum rod in with a copper binding in a little airless chamber to make that connection so that it becomes one. It's, yep. a, it's a really interesting product. And there it is, and you can see on the outside there's copper, and on the inside there's aluminum. So, so it's a, it is a conductor that's starting to get more attention um, because of the need for copper in other industries too. Yep. Now, the the uh, to to Tim's point, the the conductor is larger in overall, right? So you're using a larger conductor for that same ampacity you would have used for copper. God bless you. But so because of that, it runs cooler. So temperature is not the concern with these conductors. The concern is the termination where it lands on either a wiring device, a light switch, or whatever it is. Because now you're taking a number 10 and putting it around a little screw, <laughs> right? Or a little bolt or trying to m make that connection. Or you're using a, uh, a uh, I, I don't want to use the brand name, well, what, wire connector. Right? So I'm not allowed to use brand names. <laughs> so <laughs> you, uh, you're using a wire connector that may dig into the material and expose the aluminum. And we all know that aluminum is, uh, it, it, we expose that you get the uh, corrosion and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, you have to use special wire connectors for that, but your terminations on your receptacles and whatnot will have literature and information. We just went through and changed the standard for the receptacles to perform a mechanical test for that number 10 and to clearly identify the receptacles either on the receptacle or in literature with the right information so that it's clear on the proper application of copper clad, which again, it's not new in the industry. The number, the 10 amp number 14 was new. That's it. But if you look in, in uh, table 310.16, you'll see copper clad aluminum and aluminum columns in there. So copper clad has been around for, for quite some time. These are some, again, these are the new articles. We have 13 new articles in the 2023 edition. Many of those were medium voltage, all right? So you had your 235, which we already talked about, 245, that's your overcurrent. We took what was in 240 and we put it in 245. 305 is your wiring methods. 315, cable joints. Uh, instrument, ca that's not medium voltage, instrumentation yeah. tray cable, that's a new one. Uh, insulated bus, tubular, totally tubular covered conductors. Article 369, and I, I think that's addressing a new technology that we're seeing on the, in the industry. Sometimes what'll happen is if you have a new technology that doesn't fit somewhere, they'll create a new article for it. Yeah. So uh, I think the insulated bus pipe tubular covered conductors is one of those. Yeah. Flexible bus the, system. Yeah, there's another one. There's another one. So I, I haven't seen that yet. I think, has anybody seen a flexible bus system? We'll show you a picture of it, so it might be a little easier. I haven't actually seen that yet. It seems like it's a great idea, and if it's, uh, if, if there's, sure. I can think of a lot of installations that that would be good for. Yep. 395 is your over, that's your medium voltage. 495 is a medium voltage article. And then 512. Yeah, I. Well, go, that goes along with that new standard 420. He he tries to only inspect. I'm not he kidding. tries to only inspect Article 512 applications. Yeah. 
New standard, 420. What I didn't know, if you look, if you look at this 512, so cannabis oil, I never realized that that process is treated like a hazardous location. That's why they yeah. put it in chapter five. If you look at the requirements, there's the, the, the diagrams very much align with hazardous location type of applications. So there's a lot of stuff, and you put me in a five, five, uh, 512 application, it's gonna have a hazardous location real quick, but Absolutely. that, that Huh? You're gonna be lighting up. Uh, yeah, exactly. Put me in there. But uh, but yeah. So it's uh, there's a lot in 512. If you do any of these types of facilities, you know you have Haslock requirements. And you know what my philosophy is with Haslock? Don't put it in the hazardous locations. If yeah. it's electrical equipment, try to keep it out of there because a it's going to be very expensive, mm -hmm. and b it's just going to get more and more complicated. So absolutely. Do do less that you can in in Haslock locations. Power Limited, this was another big one. Yeah. So there's a technology out of, Cal there's a, a company in California that created a, what they called Pulsed Power. And it was totally new. They listed it to uh, standards that were basically for information technology. They're putting uh, like say upwards of 400 volts across 10 base T type of conductors that uh, you know, if you, if you think about chapter eight wiring methods, right? So chapter eight, it stands on its own. We don't really care about bundling. We don't care about the qualified person who's installing it and all that jazz. So they have this technology that was being wired and applied like a chapter eight wiring method, but significant power. Yeah. So UL created a standard. What was the standard number? 1400-1 for the equipment. 1400-1 for the equipment, dash two for the cables are the two new UL standards that, that were driven out of this product that was being made, listed again, probably to the wrong standards, definitely to the wrong standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, not by that testing agency. Yeah, but that's, that's an interesting point, Tom. So that, that 722 and that 726, right? So 726 is the class four power systems article. The 722, but being an average electrician in the field, right? I, I was an average electrician in the field. I didn't really get into the 700s when I was in the field. Like I said, maybe 760 fire alarms, because I thought they were confusing. So panel three opened my eyes, got me out of my comfort zone. And that's why I say get involved. If you have an opportunity to get on a code making panel or be a part of the process, it's amazing. It opened my eyes to a lot of things. I like what we did to 722, because what 722 did is it took the requirements out of 725, uh, 760 fire alarms, the, the general requirements that the, uh, the, the, basically the power limited circuits and default managed power, it took the redundant requirements out of those articles and put them into one article. And so now you go to one article for all of those requirements. So 722 is a great article that kind of combined and it included class four, to your point, it included class four uh, fault managed power. That might not be a common name that you, you're aware of, that there's, there's two or three companies that have uh, specific names to it, but it is an interesting um, technology. And we're gonna talk about it a little bit more when we get into the changes. Yeah, so, so. The, uh, keep in mind that one of the, the changes that the NEC is going through, this cycle, they're going to be moving chapter eight into the rest of the book. Yeah. So it's not gonna stand, hopefully. I mean, it's still in process. Yeah, right. <laughs> panel, uh, panel one has accepted a simple majority at the table, we've got to go through ballots, but they're moving chapter eight into the rest of the book, modifying 90.3 and how the book is laid out. So they're trying to address the fact that we're doing more with DC distribution. That's what this is all about. This is a pulsed power situation. It's, this is about DC distribution in structures. Yeah. Oh, and then, no. you, uh, then, then they also eliminated a uh, seven, which, which article did you guys delete? Uh, 720, 720. It was one of the classes, 720 something. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, we go might go back to that one second, Tom. Because yep. I, I want to talk about that Article 724 real quick, too. Another one, what Article 724 did, you'll see is power limited circuits for Class 1. Probably not as common as, as, as you know, you might think of Class 1 power limited circuits. We took that out of 725. That's strictly Class 2 and 3 now. Power limited circuits went into a new Article 724 non-power limited class one circuits now, well, they really have been, but it wasn't really clear. They're treated like regular circuits now uh, because they're not limited. So you won't see uh, non-power limited circuits. Those are just like regular circuits, chapters one through four wiring. So again, a lot of work went into that 722, 724 uh, stuff. Excellent.
These are the deleted ones. So yeah. 712, uh, yeah, direct current microgrids, but 720 was the one. Circuits and equipment operating at less than 50 yeah. volts was deleted. Guys said, the one. we don't need it, so get rid of it. Uh, they got rid of direct current microgrids, uh, moved some things around. So when you say deleted the article, it doesn't mean the requirements are gone outside of 720. 720, the requirements are still there, but they're just somewhere else, right? right? So each of these articles may have been deleted or moved. In some cases, they just changed the number to align with some numbering methods. All right. Okay. Ah. Article 90, Ever have, how many, I mean, Article 90 is like the, the instructions, and what do we do for its instructions? We, where are all the instructions? They're in the dumpster, right? Those dumpster blue divers. stickers from the GFI, right? Yeah. The little blue stickers from the GFI, the instructions are right next to those little blue stickers. This one, you, you like this one. Go ahead. The next slide. No, you like, oh. I like this one, but I like, I like the way you explain this, because we, we had a talk about this, what we did for this. And yeah, so, so what, they, what they did here was, it was, this is the date, right? So, yes. So whenever they have a reference in the code book, which is, this is changing. This is how I used to say it, which was now wrong based upon <laughs> the, the new uh, style manual. But they put a date, and whenever you have a reference, like say to an IEEE document or to UL, uh, or maybe not to UL standards, but to other NFPA documents and things like that, they'll put a date on the edition that they're referencing. So you know this is the edition that was used. They didn't do that for the UL standards. And how I used to say things was, well, that's because when the UL standards change, we want to make sure that the products are listed to the latest edition of that standard. That's what I used to say. But it's not right anymore because the style manual changed and they were going to require a date on every document that is referenced in the NEC. But because it's in an informational note that does not it, informational notes are not enforceable. They are information. And it just tells you at the time of the publication, when they were reviewing this, that was the current edition of the standard. Don't misinterpret it to say, Tom, you have this panel board and it's UL67. I need the one listed to UL67 yeah. as of January 5th, 2023. Yeah. That's not what that's about. That tells you what, what the standard or what the reference was at that time, but that doesn't mean that that's the addition that you need to use for the products that you're installing. Okay, they're not enforceable, they're information only. They're information. And, that's a, and that's why it's a great point, because if you're into 2017, that, that, might, that might raise a concern or a question with you. And again, I, I, well, you got these, I, I got mine last night, I was flipping through this. I have a couple tabs, I just tab things. But uh, you have amendments. So the stuff that we talk about today may get amended by your state. I mean, here's my state book. We have 19 amendments to the electrical code. So I think every state, uh, mostly every state has amendments. So just some of the stuff that we're talking about today may be affected by, by where you are here. And, and, and it's a good thing, too, to recognize that the language that you're looking at in the book, for example, UL67 just yeah. went through some changes. Right now, the, the product that you're shipping that you would ship to that standard may look different than the product that shipped five years ago. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that, you, that the standard has changed and now you have new requirements for that product when you apply that. But it helps you understand maybe the mentality of why the, the requirements are the way they are in the code. So the standard may change and may change, which will influence a code requirement change, or the code could change and influence a standard change. That's why it's really difficult if you're not on the latest edition of the code and the products have changed and you're looking at a product, you're going, well, how am I supposed to install this? Yeah. I, it doesn't align up with either the, with the requirements I, or my, my requirements permit this, but now I can't buy a product that way. Well, that's because you're on an older edition of the code book and now you've got the challenges to deal with in keeping up with the technology is changing, but the language on the installation requirements hasn't and that can put, some, put you into some some difficult situations, but I would just say leverage guys like Tom Lichtenstein in the field to understand the requirements of the product. And he may tell you, look, not only can't you buy it, but a manufacturer can't make it the way we did back in the day. Six disconnect rule, panel yeah, board. six disconnect rule. You can't have six circuit breakers in a panel board anymore based upon the latest editions of the code. So we've, we've, and we've made changes in the construction of, say, meter centers. The, the standards for meter centers are changing. 
So you might not be able to buy a product that would be permitted based on earlier editions of the code because the code's changed, the standards have changed. So just be mindful of that. And there's probably nuances all throughout the book, but that's the value of, uh, of this guy sitting up front. Absolutely. Use him, abuse him, and then uh, you know, make sure you have his cell phone number before you leave here today. So the next don't hurt. Want to switch sides? Yeah. I'm right-handed anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, we already talked about the definitions, yeah. so I don't know we have to beat this horse. Nope. Moving. We talked about that one, talked about that one. Oh, main um, oh this was a good example for yes. what you were saying earlier. Yes, so, so here, here we go. So bonding jumper, bonding jumper, you'll see bonding jumper equipment. Equipment bonding jumper helps for searchability when you're trying to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, they did that throughout. Style manual issues were big. We're going to talk about style manual issues a lot today. A lot was affected by the style manual for consistency and for ease of use. Uh, these, yeah, like the next slide is the slide that I love because it shows these definitions. But I, here's a slide that I just love that shows a lot of things that, you know, maybe more important than, obviously more important than the changes. But here we have our main bonding jumper, right? That's one of the most important things. So we have our underground meter socket here. We go to our main breaker and then we go into here. So the definitions, equipment grounding conductor, grounding electro conductor. The confusion between gr grounded conductor and equipment grounding conductor. That's one of the ones where you have to know your definitions. I, I tell you, I'm in the field pretty much um, every day or three, three to four days a week at least. And the confusion between what is a grounding conductor and what is an equipment grounding conductor, this illustration helps out and, and show that. But it really is key to know your definitions. Again, a lot of the questions come out of the definitions. So I do love that slide. It goes over the definitions. Perfect. All right, your job. Make sure he doesn't drink my water. Okay. <laughs> I can't sure write on that. Thing. Hey, I tried it. I'm not sure that's water. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, accessible definition of uh, what is accessible changed. Yes. This was. A, I think this was a great change. But what what happened here is, and it says applied to wiring method. So when when we're in the field, and again, so hit, click to the next picture, Tom. So what happened is the, the, the code in the, in the definition didn't address anything that was related to electrical systems or piping or that type of things. So what this change did is, and, and you won't see this in your books again, obviously, because it's a 2023 change, but what this change did is it says that things of piping, wiring, uh, water piping, building things cannot block in our equipment or our, conduct, our, our equipment. And the next slide's even better. We can't make that piece of equipment, there we go. We can't make that piece of equipment inaccessible by any other type, piping, wiring, anything like that. Now, the real world problem with this is in the field, the, the HVAC mechanic installs that, we wire it, sprinkler person comes in, puts the sprinkler pipe in front of it, and now all of a sudden we have a violation that gets cited because our equipment's getting blocked by something that we didn't do. So this is where the coordination becomes key. I do like this change, However, being an inspector in the field is a tough one because we cite citations or violations. We don't cite who to fix it. And basically, this one comes down to who's going who's to move the pipe or who's going to move the unit. My brother was an HVAC mechanic, and I didn't win a lot of those battles. But the change doesn't allow and, and add clarity to the language of what can, basically nothing, all electrical equipment, what can not be in front of our equipment and block it. We need access to get to service that equipment. So that, that was a really good change. And we put Velcro on all of our equipment when we ship it to his territory, because he <laughs> takes those red tags and he goes, slaps them on it. <laughs> class four, this is your class four circuit. We talked about the uh, power limited, uh, yeah. pulsed power technologies. Yeah. And you'll, you'll see the name there, right? So packet energy technology. Yep. There, there's the digital electricity is, is one of the most common ones. Um, we added six definitions, code making panel three, so you'll see CM3 behind what a class four circuit is. Is this cutting in and out? It is, I don't know why. That's a good example of what your class four is. So, so the technology works such that you take your AC, turn it into DC, you pulse it. <laughs> oh, I had to tuck it in every hole I have. it to a receiver. Beautiful. So nothing gets transmitted if the receiver is not connected. <laughs> and then it converts right. it back over to AC for, for the application. So what the, um, 
the technology claims, the, the claims for the technology were that it'll do GFCI protection, shock protection. It will do your AFCI protection. It will do your arc flash reduction. It will do all of the different uh, technologies and your overcurrent protection because it will only send these pulses when it needs it and it controls all of that. So the technology is, you know, I think it's kind of cool, but we didn't have requirements in the code to address it. And, and it's being used in large commercial buildings. Uh, out in California, they, in fact, in Texas, I think they did yeah. an entire hotel with the technology. Yeah, they did a hotel. It was a, it was a hotel. And, and that's, um, you want this? What? I can't. Oh, the pointer. Oh, yeah. He likes the, he likes the pointer. This magic Is this moment. better? Can you guys hear me now with this one? Okay. So just to elaborate what Tom said, is the, the power comes into this device here, this transmitter, and it sends it through this structural cable that has to be listed in a pulse technology in, 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 in little spurts of power. And it can go up to 450 volts DC. But it's checked about, they say, between 450, 500 times a second. So it's 450 volt to DC packs of power. That's why it didn't really fall under class two. We were having an issue with it of, right. of it's really not a class two circuit. What is it? Uh, so it, it sends that, that, was that signal or that uh, energy to what is a receiver. The receiver takes that and converts it back either to usable AC or usable DC. Most of the technology is used for lighting, so it stays at DC and it goes to the specific loads. Uh, because once you take it to the receiver, then you would need a converter to change that DC back to AC. Yep. But that hasn't happened yet, but this is gonna be, this is gonna be a technology. You know, when, when, uh, when PV systems first came out, you know, you're like, oh, that's, wow, that, where's that gonna go? Uh, this is that next electric vehicle well, PV. Yeah, so this one here, they're, they're using it right now on lighting. Yeah. Uh, on your emergency egress circuits, things like that. And we've changed uh, requirements in the code to address that in Article 700, et cetera, to identify the use of the technology. Now, here's the challenge. If you're in a jurisdiction, and everybody, you know, not everybody, I wish everybody adopted the same edition of the code, but when you don't, you now, if you face this technology in a, in a structure, who, how do you install it? Who owns the requirements? And then if you're setting your own requirements, who accepts the liability? Is it the inspector who accepts the liability? Is it the contractor? Is it the design engineer? Is it the county? I don't know, it's a good question. I'll wait for the court case, right? Yeah. So you have to think about the reasons why you, you, you follow and we make sure that we're up to speed on these technologies, how they're applied and, and uh, in the field and the requirements is all about keeping people safe. Right. But, <laughs> And in, in also, we all have licenses, right? And we all have responsibilities. I'm like, I got my PE license. I want to make sure I do things the right way because if I hurt somebody or I burn a structure down, I could own it myself, right? Another one, which is going on in the 2026 cycle, we're getting requests for marinas, yeah. okay? So we're, as a manufacturer, they're saying, hey, I need a pedestal that goes in a marina to power and charge an electric boat. Well, I'm like, I mean, my, my product lines call me and say, hey, Tom, well, what are the requirements for powering electric boats in marinas? Where do we go in the National Electrical Code? Well, an electric boat does not meet the definition of an electric vehicle because an electric vehicle, as per the National Electrical Code, is one that drives on the road. I haven't seen too many boats that drive on the road, right? Farm equipment is moving to uh, electric uh, power uh, charging, right? And the farmers like it because it or you know, most individuals who, who, who like the, um, the aspect of not uh, ruining the soil. I mean, if you're gonna plow and grow things, you don't wanna be spilling diesel fuel all over the place or, or other types of liquids. So electric farm equipment is, is becoming attractive. John Deere's coming out with equipment. Their cat's coming out with an electric backhoe and front lifters, or uh, front, uh, whatever you call it. Yeah. And front elevators. Front end loaders, front end loaders. I mean, when I was a kid, we already, I, I would ride on the bucket, which is probably not good, right? <laughs> but uh, we never did anything safe when I was a kid. I think, my, I think my parents just tried to kill us when we were young, but <laughs> they weren't successful. So, um, but in any case, when you have a technology that hits the street, if you don't have the code requirements, the, the guys in the marinas uh, around panel seven, and Tom was there, there was one gentleman who was saying, look, he's working with the inspector and they're trying to figure out what the requirements are on the fly on each project. 
which puts everybody at a disadvantage because you might have one person applying the, their requirements for one marina one way and another one a different way, and you can't you can't hit a moving target. So in any case, yeah, that's great. And, technology. and I don't know if we're going to get to Article 726 because it's a it's a long day and, and we might not get there. So since we're since we're here, uh, Article 726 is the Class Four Circuit article, and uh, what we did, you know, you. <laughs> You, you, there was a lot of concern about it's 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 tied to commercial or non-residential installations into 2023. Uh, we're working on in 2026 moving it to residences, but there was questions about how how it would operate if it was enveloped in insulation or how how it would be handled in in uh, dwellings per se. So that Article 726 only applies uh, to commercial installations or non-residential. So so this is one of the ones that kind of sometimes you can't see the forest through the trees. When our task group was working on that 726, when we first got proposed, we had all the documentation for commercial, but we didn't really have any electrical or uh, residential documentation about, will this uh, be affected in insulation? How's it gonna be affected with bundling? We had concerns. So this is kind of where you, you had a grasshopper moment. Um, originally in the scope, what we did, we came up with a scope that says, this article applies to class four circuits installed in non-dwelling units uh, only, some language like that. And it made it through the first draft and, and good thing correlating committee caught it and they called up and they said, hey, um, you know, you have, you have in the scope that this uh, doesn't apply to basically dwelling unit installations, the article. Like, yeah, that's kind of what we agreed on. And then it hit me. Well, if the only article you have for something covers what it covers and something like dwellings isn't in that section and there's no other article for that device or equipment or method, then you can install it any way you want because there's nothing in the code that <laughs> governs it. Right. Wait a minute, what? That's not what we wanted. So the correlating committee ended up taking it out of the scope and put it in 760.12, I believe, use is not permitted in other than uh, non-dwelling units. So we, we did end up straightening it out, but that was one of the times where um, it hit us. But 726 is, is getting a lot of attention and it's gonna be changing, but we might not get there this afternoon, so. So a counter and countertop applications Panel two made some changes during the 2020 code. And we added in 210.52, I think. Yes, 210.52. 210.52, I should know this. Anyway, uh, 210.52, <laughs> we added a reference to uh, receptacles in countertops and receptacles in working, uh, working space, or what we call them countertops. Work surfaces. And work surfaces, thank you, work surfaces. Now, <laughs> When we, we put the requirements in and the discussions were, you know, at the table were around, well, why, what's the difference? Well, the difference between a work surface and a countertop is driven around the amount of fluid that you could possibly spill in that area. Not possibly spill, I could spill anything anywhere. But uh, that's why I always put caps on stuff. But typically on a work surface, you're going to have, what, a coffee cup, something that's maybe 16 ounces, eight ounces or whatever. Uh, in a kitchen, which would be a countertop, you'll have uh, fluids or vessels that have more fluid in them and the more opportunity to get masses of, of, uh, of that liquid in and around the receptacle. So the uh, quantity of spillage was an, played an important role for the requirement and the proper use of the right product for the application. So you had the countertops and you have your um, kitchen countertops and you had your work surfaces. Now, Tom, were well, there changes in the UL standard that I know there were changes made? I think there were made changes made in the UL standard after we did this regarding the testing of a receptacle that was used in a countertop versus a receptacle that was used in a work surface. Do they still differentiate the volume of liquid I think that's that the they're next slide, actually? Yeah. They're both. That's the difference in what we've got in the slide. Yes. So, so after we, we went through the changes, the standard now tests them both for a half gallon. So what's the difference then? Is there a difference anymore between a receptacle for a countertop and a receptacle for a work surface? If, it's, if the spillage is the same, so... Oh, next slide. So if the spillage for work surfaces is no longer just eight ounces and it's now a half gallon of saline solution, is there truly a difference between the two? No difference between the receptacle. The testing has now been on the assembly. This was a GFCI. The other wasn't. So it has to be protected. So those in those surfaces, there has to be some door or something or to restrict them from the, the 
go in and uh, okay. they go undergo a spill test surface level. Or they tilt up or they take up or a pop up like this. Yeah. Or the pop up. Okay. Okay. So function of how they're designed. So, We're good. I think there was a okay. question. No, I think somebody had a question here. All right, question over here. Looks. Uh, so, so the uh, so you have to look at where the term is used. All right, I got to get my my spectacles. Yeah, this this is a great one, especially with the listing being different about work surface and countertop, right? And we'll we'll go through a couple slides where you could have a, a listed device that's listed for countertops because. What we used to go by was the amount of spillage. Uh, it's okay for a countertop. It's also okay for a work surface. We'll have a receptacle, the pop-up type that we'll I'll show you. We'll have a picture that's listed for a work surface because it was tested to a less amount of liquid, eight ounces. You couldn't use a liquid work surface receptacle in a countertop. Right. That's so we, we said in the in two ten dot fifty two C countertops and work surfaces. That's in kitchens pantries, breakfast rooms, dining rooms, and similar areas of a dwelling unit. So it's in C, and we have island and peninsular, peninsular, peninsular countertops and work surfaces. So we have it in 210.52C. I thought we had it in another area as well. I'm sure we do somewhere in here. So it'll depend upon, you gotta look at the, look at the requirements. 210.52, where we have our receptacle requirements is where you're gonna see the, uh, the references to uh, 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 whether it be for a, a work surface or a countertop. And when you look at the different types of products, they'll be listed for that type of an application. Yeah. And, it, and to Tom's That's point, it. some of them have the GFCI requirements. They're all, uh, uh, it might be how much fluid, the, the, the different little details. Give him the microphone. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Well, but, you know, for a work surface, it might be work with most connected, so it might be a public distribution kitchen, it's going to be hardware. It's going to be this pop up and use the work with most connected. Gotcha. Right. You may see some uh, roll around the idea of islands with a receptacle in them. Gotcha. Yep. And if you look in 406.5, receptacle mounting that tells you the details on how you mount receptacles. In 406.5E uh, e is receptacles in countertops. 406.5F is receptacles in work surfaces. So you have the requirements in 406 for the proper application of a receptacle that tells you how you're supposed to install it. So this is, the, this is the, the magic of the book, right? So you, you just can't sit in one code section. You yeah. gotta remember 406 is on receptacles, cord connectors and attachment plugs, panel boards, same way, transformers, all that good stuff, but you still gotta follow the rules. Chapters one through four apply generally, et cetera. So 406 gives you the receptacle mounting uh, requirements. And in the 2020, um, 2020 code is when we added that in the 2023 code is when we tried to add clarity on what do we mean by receptacles for countertops and receptacles for work surfaces. Ooh. Hey, there it is, 4065E, Tom. Jeez, all that. <laughs> <laughs> all the slides, right? <laughs> all right, energy management systems. So we're using energy management. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Ooh. We're going to get up to face up receptacles. There was a change well, in 406. All right, let's take a look. Receptacle mounting. Receptacles yeah. mounts in position of receptacle faces. There was the faces of receptacles. After installation, now this was, uh, I'm not sure when this changed. It's not indicated as a change in 2023. Uh, after installation, receptacle faces shall be flush with or pro project from face plates of insulating material and shall project a minimum of blah 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 for metal faces there is a face up oh no there's a face up in here a receptacle orientation countertops and works 
Uh, receptacles shall not be installed in a face-up position in or on a countertop work surface, but that's not your hydro massage. I think we need a field trip to a hydro massage and then do some <laughs> investigating, right? Um, under sinks, they got receptacles and seating areas, exposed terminals. I'm not seeing anything from a... Um, uh, I'm checking 680 real, real quick. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I look forward to your public input. Do me a favor, can you check six, uh, 680 73 in that? 680.73? Yeah, the, uh, the hydro massage part of Article 680. I, I, to... I think we need to go here, 680.73. I think, I'm not right sure. There. I remember talk about that. You know, that's the other problem with the, you know, the 2020, working on 2023, talking about the 2026. Yep. You know, yeah, I remember that. And then I'm like, oh, no, it was two editions later. It's not, we're not there yet. Um, yeah, the only thing that they have in the 20s where the hydro massage bathtub accord with the supply receptacle is accessible through the service opening, the receptacle shall be installed so its face is within direct view and not more than one foot. No, so there isn't anything about that yet. Yep. Yeah, public input though. Yeah, public input. Can't do a public comment this cycle unless somebody made a change in that area. Yeah. Yeah, so wasn't it interesting? We had we had Article 750 on this, but we didn't have a definition for what an right. energy management system was, right? That. Well, so yeah, so energy management systems are being used now. So that this is getting some attention moving forward. Energy management systems, when in panel two, I would say a couple cycles ago, put in a permission to use an energy management system, when, when an energy management system limits the amount of load that you can draw, it permitted the load calculation to reflect the values of the settings from the energy management system. And that was in Article 220. Now, fast forward a couple cycles, and we've got alternative energy solutions. You've got electric vehicles who want to power the house. You've got solar photovoltaic systems that want to provide power to the house energy storage systems that want to provide power to the house. We have in Article 702, a requirement that your backup generator has to be sized for the load, and we have what? Load shedding, right? So load shedding could be considered an energy management role that is being played, because you, what are we doing? We're, we're, if I go to the generator, I'm going to you know, shed some of my loads so to make sure that my generator so they did is, is able to supply the loads when I have an automatic transfer not, switch, as that, required in 702, new, right? I thought it was a 20, so, but it was a 20 change. So it's only we could call system. that an energy management system. Yeah, that we could both. call what we're doing in it's 220 uh, energy uh, management systems when I'm doing my load calculation. So we didn't have a good definition. Now, the I have a lot, I have, G2. and I still have a love-hate yeah, relationship with the, uh, right. with the term that's defined in the, in the book with regard to energy management systems because of the way the language reads. My phone, which I can, I can call up my phone right now and tell you how much current the lights in my basement and in my living room and my outside lights are drawing. Technically, it meets the defined term of an energy management system because it says it has to monitor, but it doesn't say and control, it says or control. In the, in the definition. So they tried to come up with a, a defined term for energy management because we're using it now in Article 705 for interconnected systems. And we're relying on the energy management system. When I do an interconnected system, if Tim is a panel board, right? So Tim's, it's the same, it's the same face that way. Panel boards always put back right. So he's a panel board, right? And I'm going to connect uh, a, uh, an energy storage system into, into Tim. So give me your arm. Give me your arm. No, I'm not holding your hand. Just yeah. All right. So, <laughs> whew. all right. So we have an energy. We have a. I have a connection into Tim, right? And now he also, through his head, comes from the utility. So now I, he's supplying loads. If I have an alternative energy, an energy storage system, or whatever supplying power at the same time the utility is supplying power, I can add more loads because he may have a 200 amp breaker uh, head for him, right? And I can let two, up to 200 amps from the utility, but now I have an additional amount of current coming from whatever's connected to this side, right? So now I can have current coming in from two different sources, and I can add more load to that panel board than the 200 amps that the main breaker is permitting to flow in. So now I can exceed the rating of the bus inside that panel board because the bus is only rated for so much current. Yeah, that's a great point. Too. Right. 
So, what we said in 705 for interconnected systems, when you are connecting on the load side of the service disconnecting means, you have to be mindful of how much current you're putting into that bus because you can't exceed the rating of the bus. You got 200 amps coming this way. If it's rated 200 amps and you're drawing 200 amps or 100 and 150 amps and you add another 60 amps, now you're gonna exceed the rating of the bus and the main breaker is not going to trip. Now you can generate heat and you can have that piece of equipment be overloaded beyond its application. So we have specific rules in 705 for interconnected systems to limit that from occurring. And what they did in 705 was recognized, hey, if you have an energy management system, now you can rely on the set point of the system to limit the amount of current that's flowing into him and the main, right? So now you're relying on a set point in, a, in a, some software application to, to limit the amount of current that is passing into that, into that enclosure. So the code said, hey, we're gonna permit this. We're gonna permit you to size equipment based upon these settings. In the 2026 code cycle, they're going, wait, we've got some issues here because now it's a safety related aspect of an energy management system. I started with my company in 1996. And my first day, I had already had five years in the, in the industry or six years in the industry with regard to power systems analysis and design. I start my first day and I'm, I'm working on applications and we are installing energy management systems to do what? In major, major uh, your Fords, your Chryslers, your GMs, your PPGs, all these different organizations are trying to uh, make sure they don't hit a peak demand. So they're installing energy management systems, but they're not relying on it to size conductors, service conductors, and equipment. They're just saying, hey, I want to avoid a peak demand. I'm going to do some load shedding. When my energy goes up, I'm going to turn this motor off. I'm going to make sure that that motor and that motor don't start at the same time and I hit a peak demand with my utility. Well, that's a different use of an energy management system. So what the code is doing right now, and there's a task group uh, that is associated with this, they're trying to address the use of the term energy management, the standards associated with energy management system equipment to make sure that you are using the right equipment for that job. And if your energy management system relies on a cloud, like EV chargers. Yeah, EV chargers. EV charging equipment is using, is, is, is relying on, the, in some cases, the cloud for set points on how much current they're going to draw and whatnot. So now they're into this energy management world using a cloud-based system. What happens if the cloud goes away? Right. right? What happens if, if I uh, forget to turn it on or my brain goes dead, which for me it happens often, but in the equipment it may happen. And if it does, what's the default yeah. values and will I now overload my service, my conductors, my equipment? So you're going to see a lot of changes moving forward to address the use of energy management systems when we're relying on that to size services, feeders, and I other distribution. I, I guess my, it's also important what can be on an energy management system. Yes. You know, so hopefully we get to that. Yeah, and 750 is your article. So they created uh, Article 750 for energy management systems. There's listing requirements in there and other requirements as well. There we go. Yep, we're seeing a lot of these. And you remember in 408, we have uh, restrictions on what can be placed inside of panel boards. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 312 too. Right. Cabinets also. Yeah. 312. Yeah. 312.8 has that too. And they actually added language to clarify that because it, that's one of the things that I, I, I get questions about a lot. Can we put things in panels? What What can be in a panel? How much space do I need? Right. We can't put a low voltage transformer in a panel, even though I've seen that in, in condos. But what can I put in the cabinet? Right. The panel board goes inside the cabinet. That's right. Yeah. So in 312, we're looking for what can be allowed in that space. They did put some language about energy management specifically mentioning it, but you, you will see energy management equipment inside the cabinet where your panel board is that we call a service or a panel. So when you get to this type of equipment, you see this in the field, you know you got chapter three, you yeah. got chapter four. 408 for panel boards, 312. It's 312 for cabinets. 312 for cabinets. And remember, in this picture, the panel board is not the entire assembly. The right. panel board is just the guts. Right. that's installed in an enclosure. And they created a new defined term in Article 100 for an enclosed panel board 
in addition to just the word panel board yeah. because of the way it's used in the code. Right. All right, ground fault. What do we do here? Oh, metallic versus metal. Metallic. Metallic's a finish, metal's a material. Yeah. So not going to change how you, you do know, it. You know, style though. manual issue thing. Again, we're, we're going to talk about style manual issues a lot today, and that was one of them. Yep. So I don't, I don't see it changing how we do business, so let's no. move on. Uh, how many people do impedance grounded systems? Anybody? That's why Tom handles this. That's one. why we go Me boom, either. boom. <laughs> but we added some clarity. You know, defined <laughs> terms. We've defined what one of the conductors are in an impedance grounded system to add clarity for the requirements. You can't. You're making assumptions if you don't know what a piece of equipment or a conductor is to meet those defin definitions. There's a, great, there's a great picture of that coming up. Which one? This one? No. Yeah, uh, next one. That one. That one, yeah. That's a great picture to kind of give the idea of what is the PD's grounded system, where's the conductor, and you'll see it. I don't have the clicker, but. Excellent. There's your impedance, your resistors. And you know what you do here? They, they put the distance in between because that's where you put your, your hot dogs in here and your chickens <laughs> of, up here, right? Impedance grounded systems, they, you know, again, the reason you do impedance grounded systems, ungrounded systems, we used to love those. Industrials used to love those because that first ground fault's a gimme, and then you gotta go find it. And then they realized that the voltages go all over the place. And then they said, well, solidly grounded systems are great too, but that first fault is a doozy. So they added an impedance to limit that ground fault. So when you have a fault in an impedance grounded system, you limit it to a certain value. You know the fault is there. You still have the boat with an anchor, so you don't have the voltage fluctuations. So you get the best of both worlds. You get yeah. the reliability, uh, but you got to make sure you follow all those rules. Yeah, and that's the thing. The detection system that you have, we used to have the bus bars with the lights, and if you had three lights on, and if one got dim or went out, then you yep. were going to run into a bigger problem if you didn't fix it soon. Yeah. If you had what they one. used to use was apprentices. They had one, <laughs> one apprentice for each phase. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then we had a shortage of resources, so we had to change it. Come up with technology. Insight from this was a this was a. If you wanted to go back one slide, this uh, what happened again? A style manual issue, right? So definitions can't have requirements in them, and it's really written. I had to read it a couple times to see what they changed. The definition of insight from, with insight from, had the requirement of what that meant. So what they did, or what happened here, is they took, they took the language out of the, they took, the, they took the requirement out of the definition, put it in a 110.29, revised the definition of with insight. So now it explains what it is and doesn't contain the requirement. And again, I had to read it a couple times, so like, yeah. okay. But fundamentally, yeah, nothing changed. Nothing changed. It's just you're going to reference a section in the code instead of the definition. Can't have requirements and definitions. Can't have requirements and definitions. Look at that. There's a little transformer, baby transformer on top of yeah. daddy transformer. Okay. okay. Likely to become energized. Yeah. Also, um, always a, one of those. So when you have requirements in the code that says, you have to do X, Y, and Z when it's likely to become energized. Everybody's like, well, what is likely to become energized? So we never really had a definition for that, so we now do. And become energized compared to what is likely energized. What was the, where's the definition? We didn't have it up there. No. Conductive material, so here we go, factors. If you have a conductive, conductive material, conductive material could be energized or could be due to a failure of electrical insulation. So yeah. if you have. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess so, that's, so that's why this slide, you know, so we have a panel board, right? The panel board is in the cabinet. We have conductors here. Conductor has insulation on it. The breakdown of an insulation there could energize this cabinet. That's likely to become energized. Yep. What could be energized? Well, if I had two types of insulation in a pipe, you need two types to break down to energize the pipe. That, that could become energy, energized. But likely to become energized is a breakdown of an insulation in an, in an area where it could have damage. So the, I think the definition does need a little love still. I mean, it's yeah. better than nothing, but... Um, I agree. It's, at least we have it. Absolutely. Now, another part of energy management is load management, yeah. right? So the moment you have, when you're shedding loads, like we said in that 702 system, I'm going to shed loads, make sure I don't overload the generator. Now we have a defined term for load management, and we're using that term in 750 for energy management. We're using it in 705. 705. We're using it in a few other articles as well. Yeah. This was, how many of you guys and gals do uh, either man-made or artificially made bodies of water? 
Anybody? Illinois doesn't have uh, ponds. Yeah, we got some. We got a few. While everybody was worried about like in in uh, in 551, 555, and 682, we have specific requirements that tell you the electrical equipment has to be above the um, the normal high water levels and things like that, right? So we'll have the uh, we have requirements on where you can and cannot place equipment. Well, now how do I know what the normal high water is? And if you asked, I, I asked a, a bunch of different yeah. inspectors. Dean Hunter is one of them, yeah. and I'd say. How do you determine normal high water? Some, some of them go, well, I go to this reference, and if you look on the website, and if you look at this page, it'll tell you the last so many years, whatever, and then you, some inspectors go, well, I just look at the shoreline, and you can see pretty much where that water level went up, and it's eroding, and it doesn't go beyond that, and that's sort of what I use. Both of those are probably very legit, but it was never in the code, and it was always a point of discussion and debate in the field so we added some clarity. Definition. I like this definition. And that's your datum plane. Yeah. So remember, you got to keep things above the electrical datum plane. I, that's why I like floating marinas as opposed to <laughs> marinas in place. You know, the datum plane just goes up and down all the time. And that's your 555.3a for floating piers, all that good stuff. Look at that. See, that one, all those posts, those blue posts, that's solid, man. That water goes up and it comes down. All right, so the 690 folks. <laughs> I love those guys. On panel four, they created another term, PV DC circuits. So in a PV system, when you get into photovoltaic systems, they don't like to call things feeders. They don't like to call things branch circuits. They don't like to call conductors service conductors. Why? Because that brings a lot of other requirements along with it. So they try, they're trying to keep, the, keep you in the requirements in 690. And so they defined a term PV DC circuits and they have requirements around PV DC circuits for, for us to follow. And they defined them as your, your PV source circuit, your PV string circuit. So all of your DC circuits in a PV system now are called PV DC circuits, and then they change the requirements in the in 690 to help you understand what you need to do to properly protect a PV DC circuit. Clarity. Yeah, the illustrations are. I, I love this. Uh, there you go. So the illustrations help. What is what's the difference between a PV string circuit and a PV source circuit, right? So the illustration shows you where the location is. The string circuits between the modulars. The PV source circuit is between the modulars and the shutdown or the inverter. So definitions with PV systems have come a long way. Very helpful. Yes. Yep. Um, and you have to understand what, where you're at in the system to understand are you, are you yeah. supposed to follow the re requirements for a PV string circuit or am I following the requirements for my PV source circuits? Yeah. Yep. All right, industrials. We all see the exceptions. Yeah. Right? We have the exceptions that says for those industrials where you have condition of maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you have the requirement and then you have the industrial exception. And I always say the reason those exceptions are there is because what do I need to make a code change? I need two thirds <laughs> and you need that one vote. So you can get that industrial vote if you get that exception in there. But, uh, but in any case, we didn't know what is a rest restricted industrial establishment. So they came up with the uh, a defined term. Where you restrict public access, where the condition of maintenance and supervision ensure that only qualified persons service the equipment and we use that again primarily in exceptions throughout the book yeah align with the requirements yep so that's that servicing uh, yeah so well now that we had now that we, we had refurbished or we had uh, reconditioning now that we had reconditioned and we have maintenance and we have servicing we, we needed a definition and a definition was needed to show what the difference is between those two Right, because a lot of times I think people confuse recondition with general maintenance or general servicing on, on a piece of equipment. If I have a transfer switch and a transfer switch has maybe a little cube relay, and what I need to do is uh, my cube relay goes bad. Well, I wanna go change the cube relay of the transfer switch. Well, am I refurbishing or reconditioning my transfer switch or am I just providing maintenance and servicing it and changing the relay, right? So recondition means bringing back to operating condition as part of the definition. This definition for servicing kind of helps and, and helps clarify the difference between reconditioning and, and servicing. And, and it's very, it's a helpful definition. 
So reconditioning is electromechanical systems, pretty broad, equipment, apparatus, or components that are restored to operating conditions. So I have a panel board, and my breaker goes bad in my panel board, and I'm gonna replace that breaker. Am I reconditioning the panel board? Because it was broke, and now I'm bringing it back to a working condition, yeah. and then the code may say you're not permitted to recondition a panel board, right? So what am I doing? So we had to add, we had to add clarity that I, if I'm following manufacturer's instructions, if you re look at the rest of reconditioning definition, this process differs from normal servicing of equipment that remains within a facility or replacement of listed equipment on a one-to-one -one basis. So I replace a breaker, or to your point, that yeah. little brick uh, uh, yeah. relay inside of a transfer switch. If I'm following manufacturer's instructions and replacing it, I don't meet the definition of recondition. What's the so actual then, definition of servicing in there? What is it? Well, yeah, so then the next question was, well, if I'm servicing it, then what does it mean? So, and, and then what are the requirements around servicing? So servicing says the process of following a manufacturer's set of instructions or applicable industry standards to analyze, adjust, or perform prescribed actions upon equipment with the intention to preserve or restore the operational performance of the equipment. So servicing can, can, can include maintenance, and PA 70B covers the maintenance. If I'm going to do maintenance to get a product or an application, a motor, I'm gonna lubricate, I'm gonna do all these things on the motor to get things working, I'm not reconditioning it, I am servicing it. So now I'm not following the requirements on reconditioning, I'm following the requirements in 110 for servicing. So 110.17? 110.17, thank you, my walking code book. 110.17, servicing and maintenance of equipment. Servicing and electrical preventative maintenance shall be performed by qualified persons trained in servicing and maintenance of equipment, so you better be qualified. One, the servicing and, and electrical preventative maintenance shall be performed in accordance with the original equipment manufacturer's instructions. So the moment you go outside of the instructions, you are now possibly reconditioning it. So if you look at a circuit breaker, let's say that uh, you look at the circuit breaker and you go, the handle on this thing broke. But I got a good one over here that no longer opens for whatever reason, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna open the breaker, <laughs> take it apart, take the handle off of that one and put it over here. Am I following manufacturer's instructions? No, right? And in Article 240, in 240.2, we tell you, you shall not recondition a molded case circuit breaker. Well, now the, the action that you are doing on that breaker is not servicing because you're not following manufacturer's instructions. You've taken it apart, you're moving parts around. Now you're reconditioning it and in 240, you're not permitted to recondition. So now you can't do that. So that's sort of how the, the workflow goes. So you've got to really understand, that's why terms are very important. You've got to understand what does the term, what am I doing? Does it meet this definition or the, if it's reconditioning? I've got to follow the rules on reconditioning. If it's servicing, I've got to follow the rules on servicing. So what they did in the 2023 cycle was they added that clarity to help you understand you're either going to do one or, or the other. You're either going to recondition it or service it. Yes, sir. You said the words. Now, two things. One, handle ties are not listed, right? Handle ties are identified, right? And that's, it's an identified handle tie on a breaker. If it's an identified handle tie, you're going to a manufacturer's instructions that's gonna tell you which handle ties can be applied on that. And there's gonna be instructions on how to install that handle tie. I'll take you one further. We have circuit breakers where you can take the front off of that circuit breaker and add shunt trip, zone selective interlocking, right? That's per manufacturer's instructions. They're listed that way. They're li the screws that you're gonna be taking out are designed to be taken out and put back in again. On many of the molded case circuit breakers, those screws that are in there, they're like self-tapping screws. If you've ever taken one of those puppies out and try to put them back, they're not the same, even if you get them in. And, and you know what you don't do? The, the toothpick thing doesn't work. Don't stick the toothpicks in there and well, I mean, try works, to do that but... again. That's not, that's ungood, technical term, ungood, all right? So those types of, the handle ties are good. You can go as far as following manufacturer's instructions and put uh, zone selective interlocking, shunt trip, accessories in or on a breaker. But if it's not a part of a manufacturer's instruction, which means it's not a part of the listing, 
you're on your own. And if you do that, let's say you're reconditioning it. Let's say it's permitted, power circuit breakers. You're permitted to recondition a power circuit breaker. So you recondition the power circuit breaker. Then you go to 110 for reconditioning and marking requirements, right? 110.20. 20. <laughs> 110.20, thank you, my walking code book. Reconditioned equipment. It says reconditioned equipment shall be permitted except where prohibited, right? So we said in 240, you're prohibited on multi case circuit breakers, but you're permitted on power circuit breakers. Equipment that is restored to operating condition shall be rec reconditioned with identified replacement parts. So any parts you put in there have to be identified by who? It could be identified by the manufacturer. But what if it's a 1942 uh, breaker that the manufacturer you know, is maybe six foot under? I don't know where, where that company is. You can still follow anybody who makes those parts. You can follow their instructions on how to properly install those parts because there's, there's conditions here. Uh, it says identified replacement parts verified under applicable standards that are either provided by the original equipment manufacturer that are designed by an engineer experienced in the design of replacement parts for the type of equipment being reconditioned. So you've got some options, both of those, right? Now you have A, B, and C, first level subdivisions. Yeah. A is equipment required to be listed. In some cases, Article 240, I love this one when it went in. We put a requirement that if you recondition a power circuit breaker, it's required to be listed. But at the time, if you bought a new one, it wasn't required to be listed. <laughs> I know, that's what I said. But in any case, in the 2023, we require all breakers, low voltage breakers to be listed. But in any case, if it's required to be listed, equipment reconditioned required by this code to be listed shall be listed or field labeled. So you can get, I think UL, ETL, uh, a few others have, uh, uh, field evaluation bodies that would do the field evaluation for equipment that's reconditioned in the field, right? Oh yeah, I'm getting the nod, all right, perfect. So equipment not required to be listed, equipment that is reconditioned and not required by the code to be listed shall comply with one of the following. Be listed or field labeled, so you can list it if, even though it's not required, or have a reconditioning performed in accordance with the original equipment manufacturer's instructions. And then you have approved equipment. If the options specified in A and B are not available, the authority having jurisdiction. This is the good one for all you inspectors in the room. I love that. it. Oh, you don't like that? No, I just got that. Oh, <laughs> give me the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he was he was like, don't do this because I do that to my books. <laughs> you know, and the first page that falls out of all my books is the tap rules. So that. my 2020 funny, code man. book, tap rule, first page that came out. 2023. <laughs> First page that came out with tap rules. So I, I want anybody we have a good else. slide on that too. Yeah, I should do a slide on it. Let's um, see that. Yeah, having jurisdiction shall be performed to approve the reconditioning. So you have the AHJ who's permitted to, to approve the reconditioning, who's going to rely on maybe that AHJ is going to say, yeah. I want to fill an evaluation because I'm not accepting responsibility. I never manufactured a circuit breaker in my life, I've never done it, and I want someone who knows what they're looking at to look at this. So it'd be within their right to require a field evaluation, somebody with other eyes to look at. It. Yeah, perfect. And, and so we'll end because it's break time. We'll, we'll end with the definition was needed because, you know, in the 2020, when we put the definite, when the definition of recondition was put in, it caused a lot of problems. So that yes. definition helps with the definition that was put in the 2020. So it's break time. What, what do we say for a break? Four hours. Oh, four hours. We're going till 10 o'clock, right? Rule number one, we never let the electricity come. <laughs> oh, you're not allowed to leave. Just a Fifteen minutes, which means we want to be back here in fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to shut this down. Thanks. There you. If you're out there watching, appreciate it. And um, remember, you can always go to IEI and get uh, get these guys or other presenters to do an educational program either at your JTC, at your facility, whether you're a manufacturer, industrial, wh whoever it is, doesn't matter. We don't uh, we don't discriminate no. in that regard. So. Um, be more than happy to, uh, IAEI would love to uh, participate and help you understand the code. All right? Thanks. Jim.
Plochi, rock star. <laughs> oh, cool. Let's try it. Okay. If it doesn't, then we'll keep this by you. When Tom talks, yep. I can